Men are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? Welcome to Answers News for Wednesday, February 28th, 2024. In today's top story, the top minds of the 21st century discover men and women are not the same. Hello, I'm Dr. Georgia Purdom. This is Jessica DeFord and Rocket Rob Webb. And so let's get right into this. Men and women's brains do work differently. Science just discover for the first time. Surprise, okay. surprise. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that pretty much we've all known, mm -hmm. right, um, for a long time. And I will say, I've actually been doing a lot of research and study into this recently, like the biological differences between men and women for an upcoming uh, presentation that I'm going to give. And we've actually known for quite a while that the brains are wired differently. Um, the brains are different. It's just now this has been... Um, I studied better, and we have better ideas of maybe what some of that is than we have before. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty neat, the research that was done to conduct this study, because they used some AI learning and where a machine was scanning different brain scans, and the machine was able to pick out the different um, hotspots of a, a man and a woman on these scans versus what a human eye could see. So the fact that they were able to do that with technology is actually really neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say this was a mind-boggling discovery, I oh guess, for boy. them. Blew their minds. Yeah. Uh, they liked it. See, that's a man's brain right there. Right. They're doing the puns, we're not. Right. Yeah, one, of the, one of the things I appreciate from this article, though, they said women tend to be better at reading comprehension, writing ability, and on the average have a good long-term memory. Is that a fact? Guys, I mean, like, just I just thought, I thought about my wife. I mean, just talk about the memory she has. I mean, almost like on a weekly basis, I'm like, oh, we have, you know, this dinner date. We have this coming up. I, I don't even remember. But the wife seems to always remember those things. So, obviously, it's just common sense there. And like JJ was saying, um, it was actually really good research, pretty interesting te uh, technology that they were using. They were using something called explainable I AI. So it was a model that was shown a whole bunch of MRI scans of, I think, 1,500 brain scans. And they basically, it was asked, you know, is this from a man? Is this from a woman? And 90% of, of the time, it was able to detect which one it was coming from by analyzing each one of these hotspots. So pretty cool observational science in there. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of these differences, you know, why why are they different? Well, because men and women have different sex chromosomes, okay? Men have XY and women have XX. And so that leads to sex hormone differences, which leads to differences, not just in the brain, obviously, but lots of other areas of the body as well. So that's why you have these differences between men and women. And, you know, in our culture, the problem is, is a lot of times they want to make men and women the same. Like in order to be equal, we have to be the same. I call it the sameness kind of idea. And that is just that is just totally against God's good design of men and women. I mean, he designed us differently for a purpose, right? And I think it's, it's not something to squash, which is what our culture wants to do, but celebrate um, mm -hmm. that we think differently. I know I, for one, like when we have meetings here at AIG and if I'm with a group of people, I always like it to be a mixture of men and women because they just look at problems differently. They approach problems differently. They have unique ways of, of thinking through things and there's advantages and to that, right? To having both sides of that, so to speak, analyzing that and trying to come up with solutions to that. Yeah, and in a biblical worldview, it doesn't distinguish between biological sex and gender, but with some of the things that's here in this article, they are making those distinctions. One of the doctors, Dr. Gina Rippon, was quoted as saying, the key issue is whether these differences are a product of sex-specific biological influences or of brain-changing gender experiences. So that's the belief that your gender is fluid, that it's a construct of the cultural whims or society is going to determine your gender, but we don't see that in a biblical worldview. And that goes back to a naturalistic a view of evolutionary ide ideology that we've normalized and accepted that each person can be the arbiter of their own identity, but that's not what God's word says either. God designs our identity. He makes people, so he gets to determine what's a male, what's a female, and um, we've exchanged that for a lie that your identity can be self-designed, but that's just false. And speaking of God's word, the biblical worldview, we have that basis for the differences between male and females. And by the way, if you guys are looking for a great video series, uh, Truth in 10 YouTube videos, I highly encourage you guys to go check it out. Uh, done by our new executive CEO, Martin Isles. It's on his YouTube channel. He just recently did two videos on what is a man, what is a woman. He goes back to Genesis 2 and 3 to actually show. I mean, it's very clear for men, we're called to work, we're called to keep, we're called to guard, we'll be leaders, providers, and protectors of society. Women are called to be helpers and mothers and life givers. And 
man was actually pointed towards the garden. So men are pointed towards the mission, towards things. And that's why a lot of the times we tend to like movies and books about missions and explosions and all sorts of stuff like that. Whereas women were pointed when the woman was, was created, it was pointing towards the man, pointing towards Adam. So that's why they liked the relational books. You know, he loved her and she loved him and blah, blah, blah. And on it goes. And so, um, again, we have that biblical worldview, right? It goes back to Genesis. And that's why we see those great, um, those differences. And like uh, Georgia Purden was saying, uh, we shouldn't try to squash those. We should try to celebrate those, right? Men and women, they complement each other. Those things that my wife can do and there's, there's uh, that, that I, I obviously cannot do. And there's things that, she, that I can do that she can't. And so, obviously, we complement each other. And that's how we work so great together. And so it's just great to see science catching up with what uh, God's Word has been saying for thousands of years. This article also says that experts are hopeful that finding differences between male and female brains could be crucial in tackling neurological or psychiatric conditions that affect women and men differently. Well, it does have implications on the medical field, how much dosage or what your prescription is if you're a male or if you're a female. That's going to determine um, your treatment. So that is important to be able to distinguish between a man and a woman yeah, for those very things. Important. And it's important, too, because traditionally women have been very underrepresented in a lot of clinical studies. And so the problem is, is that, um, again, we, we should not deny these differences. These are legitimate design differences. And we need to understand that because um, how women and men are diagnosed for certain diseases and how they're treated can vary a lot um, just because, again, we are different. And so um, that's a good thing that I think they're discovering and wanting to do more. Um, I know, obviously, Jessica, and I are really big fans of women's health and, um, yes. and having the proper um, tools and diagnosis and treatments for women and, um, and again, celebrating those differences and helping mitigate the effects of the fall um, differently, right, mm -hmm. in, in the world that Very we live important. in. All right, Alabama Supreme Court rules frozen embryos or children under state law. So this is always good to have some Good news, all right? So this was very, very good news um, in that frozen embryos are now considered children under state law, at least in Alabama. And the reason that this even went to the Supreme Court, like how did this even get there? Um, so there were three uh, couples, three sets of parents who had their embryos frozen from a IVF procedure um, at a fertility clinic. And and I'm still not quite sure how this happened, but yeah. somehow those embryos were accidentally destroyed, okay? So yeah. those children died um, as a result of that. And so they had a wrongful death suit that they brought to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided, based on an 1872 state law, that um, basically that parents or people can sue for the death of their unborn children, that these are children regardless of their location and regardless of their developmental stage. And so that's an awesome affirmation, right, of the word of God, that we are children, that we are all, from the moment of fertilization, from the moment that is a living human being, that that living human being is made in the image of God and that that life needs to be preserved and protected. Absolutely, yes. There's a lot of um, fear about this ruling because it says that the ruling brought a rush of warnings about the potential impact on fertility treatments and the freezing of embryos, which had previously been considered property of the courts, which is scary. These are human beings, so they shouldn't be the property of the courts. But it does have implications on IVF. A lot of women do rely on that for fertility treatment. But human life is not to be trifled mm -hmm. with. And so we must remember that human beings are made in the image of God, and it starts at fertilization when an egg and a sperm meet. And so we see that from the very beginning. And so it is not to be trifled with. We, we need to be very careful. These are human beings who are mm -hmm. made in the image of God. God. Yeah, throughout this article, they're struggling to equate the baby as a fertilized egg with the baby outside the womb, trying to have equal value because of their anti-biblical worldview. And that's why it's so important as Christians, we have that biblical worldview that gives us that basis, that foundation. And the Chief Justice, Tom Parker here, when he issued his concurring opinion, I would just want to read for you guys a few of the quotes here because he was spot on um, with a lot of the things he said. Uh, he said, even before birth, all human beings bear the image of God and their lives cannot be destroyed without effacing his glory. He goes on, life cannot be wrongfully destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy God who views the destruction of his image as an affront to himself. It's as if the people of Alabama took what was spoken of 
uh, by the prophet Jeremiah and applied it to every unborn person in this state. And then he quotes Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And then he finally concludes with, by saying, carving out an exception for the people, in this case, small as they were, would be unacceptable to the people of this state who have required us to treat every human being in accordance with the fear of a holy God who made them in his image. Amen, right? I mean, that came from a chief justice there, so amen to that. In case you guys, maybe this is the first time you heard this, yes, human life does begin at fertilization. When that moment, when the sperm meets the egg, that is when human life begins. That is a biblical and that is a scientific fact that cannot be disputed. And so that's why we say all the time that life begins at fertilization and life must be protected from that moment on. And regardless of your opinion on IVF, I think we can all agree that we can't destroy life from that moment of fertilization. So if you are going to go through with the IVF procedure, you got to make sure it's done responsibly in a responsible manner where you're not creating life to then be destroyed. And I think something too, one of the, the article and, and quoting someone that's like concerned about this particular ruling, they said, it's a terrifying development for the one in six people impacted by infertility who need in vitro fertilization. Now here's the thing, no one needs. <laughs> we got to define the, define the difference between a need and a want, right? Okay, so I, my husband and I, we suffered with infertility, okay? And so I'm speaking as someone in that camp, so to speak. No one needs any kind of reproductive technology. They might want that in order to have a child, but they don't need that. And, and we have to think about those things, right? We have, to, like, like Jessica was saying, human life is not something to be trifled with. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to consider that. My husband and I, we chose adoption, okay, in order to add children to our family. So there are lots of ways that we can do that and do that well. Um, and, um, and with in vitro fertilization, like I say, there are a lot of um, problems sometimes with how the embryos are treated and, and defective ones being um, destroyed. And, you know, there are a lot of things that can be problematic with that. And so we have to be very, very careful. But we have to understand that as parent, as human beings, yes, as a married couple, we want children, right? Um, and we have to ask, what is the Lord's will for helping us be able to um, do that and have children as part of our family? Definitely. We can praise God for the justices, too, who were deciding this ruling. And then also we can pray for them, because mm -hmm. I'm sure they're going to experience some attacks against them for their stand on biblical authority in this area. And pray for other states to follow Alabama's um, example here. But just pray for this state and whatever state that you're in that they do the same thing as well. And I'm amazed too, like all throughout this article, of course, this is from NPR, so it's a liberal news source, but they're talking, they're quoting people that are saying, well, this is a, a fertilized egg. So it's not a human being, right? It's not a child. It's a fertilized egg, they say, which is a clump of cells, right? So my thing is, like, we're all clumps of cells, okay? <laughs> so if are you. you. If you want to be specific about yeah. it, everyone's clump of cells. So the question is, what is it? Like, if it's not a human being, exactly what is it? That's my question. No one can, right. you cannot escape the reality, the biological reality, the biblical reality that this is a human being. Yeah. And um, there was even another article in the Washington Post that this author, and it just is just uh, despicable to me that someone could say this. They said it's a cluster of hopeful cells. I guess the cluster is hoping that it will be born someday, right? And according to this author, that's when that hopeful cells become a child. They also called it a hopeful blob. Right? So you just see this complete disregard right, mm -hmm. for human life. Yeah. Um, regardless, though, I, again, and, and that's what we love about what these justices ruled, starting with a biblical worldview, which mm -hmm. is so refreshing to see that this is a human being, regardless of stage of development, regardless of location, made in the image of God, and therefore that life should be protected. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and people are, and I'm glad a lot of people are concerned and upset because they know the implications of that's this. Right. Yep. for abortion, for some of these fertility treatments. And that's a, that's a good thing. And, and we, we rejoice in that. I have a baby in my womb right now. It's yep. not a clump of cells. <laughs> it's a human. Yeah, it's a human June being. Fifth. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Neanderthal's usage of complex adhesives reveals higher cognitive ability scientists discover. Okay. <laughs> this is yet another chapter in, wow, Neanderthals are people too. Uh, yeah. And we already knew this. And we have an exhibit here at the Creation Museum that actually talks about this in a little more detail. Because a lot of times the way that Neanderthals are portrayed in our culture is they're just like dumb brutes, right? And they're, they're lower in an evolutionary 
um, scale. You know, they're not as highly developed as modern human beings. And but ev but every once in a while, one of these articles will come out where, as they study this more and more, they discover that indeed um, they they had these high cognitive abilities, similar to you know almost equivalent to modern humans. They made musical instruments. They you know they buried their dead. They did all of the things that other humans do. So they therefore are humans. Yeah, I thought this article was a little boring because as Dr. Purdom <laughs> said, it's another installment that Neanderthals are human. And but it is cool that they what they found that there was a multi-component adhesion adhesive uh, with these Neanderthals and the tools that they were making. Um, but I think it's important too, they, they say here, overall the development of adhesives and their use in the manufacture of tools is considered to be some of the best material evidence of the cultural evolution and cognitive abilities of early humans. So they believe that humans are evolving here, which is not true. We did not evolve from a lesser human. God made us in his image. And we are distinct from animals to another ape-like creatures that also supposedly we evolved from. But personhood is ultimately not determined by the use of tools or cognitive ability. Because what does that mean then for somebody who's in a coma, who can't use tools or doesn't have a, what would be considered a normal cognitive function right now? So personhood is defined by God who made people in his image. Yeah, again, just this, this whole, uh, you know, they're dumb brutes and they're all of a sudden surprised that they're using all these tools. I think we need to stop sticking with this false narrative here. Sticking. Oh, well, there we go again. That's There's right. that male brain. They, they like the first one, but not the oh, second one. <laughs> but it's just great to see that these evolutionists are finally catching up to what creationists have been saying for a long time. We've been saying that Neanderthals, they're not this mysterious group of people. They're just a group of people descended from Adam and Eve who lived in a very harsh uh, post-flood um, world that was around in the Ice Age. They, like Dr. Perrin was saying, they made weapons, they wore makeup, they buried their dead, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, we would expect that from a biblical world view. And so again and again, it's just like this, our, this is our monthly installment of, oh, they found out more evidence that Neanderthals really are human. But this is pretty interesting technology, pretty interesting research that they had here. Basically, the adhesive that they found was a mixture of osher, which is clay basically, and then uh, bitumen, I think that's how you say it, kind of like an adhesive tar. And then they said that uh, it was surprising because the osh content was more than 50%, but when you have that, it loses its adhesive properties when it's mixed with air-dried bitumen. But it was different when they considered liquid benjamin because um, although it's not really suitable for gluing, when you add the osher, 55% of it, then all of a sudden it's just sticky enough but without adhering to hands, making it suitable for material to be able to handle. In other words, it's like they knew what they were doing, right? They actually designed these tools with purpose in mind. So again, wrong starting point is going to lead to wrong conclusions. Wrong assumptions is going to lead you to wrong conclusions. In this case, the evolutionary worldview, they're going to get those wrong conclusions. But if we start from a biblical worldview, it makes sense. It's consistent. Yeah, and they're not from, they state in their article, 120 to to 40,000 years ago, right? It's just Imagine about 4,500 years ago after the flood. These, this group of people, they probably lived in a very isolated area, um, and that may be why they had the heavy brow ridges and some of the characteristics that are unique to Neanderthal, um, but they're not. They're just variations, basically, on what we see in all human beings, and so, again, fully made in the image of God. All right, Illinois bill changed its definition of abused child to include kids whose parents object to abortion, transgender hormone, and surgery. And so when I read this article, I thought if I lived in the state of Illinois and had children, I'd be considering possibly moving to another state. Yeah, you know, because we... this is really, I mean, this is really frightening to see this. We've seen this happen in some other states in isolated cases, but this is the first one to introduce a bill. Now, it has not passed yet. It has not become law, thankfully, and th we hope and pray that it will be stopped. But the idea is that an abused child could also include people, young people, whose parents object to receiving um, pubic puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, transgender surgeries, and abortion. And when I read this, I thought, you know, what this really is, it's a form of Marxism. So the idea is that parental rights should be denied and children should be owned by the state, not by individual parents. And so that's really what they're, they keep moving in that direction. That's why we see a lot of these parental rights things is that's really what it's a move towards is that the state knows what's best for your child, not you as a parent. And so that's a, that's a frightening thing that we're mm -hmm. moving towards. And that's exactly what this bill 
would do if it was passed because they say it shields doctors from liability if they prescribe such treatments to minors who do not have parental consent and empowers the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services to step in and if they deem it necessary, remove children from their biological parents based on the new definition of abused child. That's mm -hmm. a very scary thought. And it's absolutely astounding that the literal murder of a child, the mutilation of a child, and people who oppose that would be considered child abusers. That is just astounding, and honestly, it's wicked. Yeah, yeah, this, uh, this article made me angry. It's just more evidence of a Roman one culture that has utterly lost its mind. Our culture has lost its mind. I, I just keep praying, may God have mercy on this nation. We're living in a secular post-Christian culture that really is at war with biblical truth, right? Hates the truth, hates children. We're seeing this war on children, the war on the family unit, which makes sense. I mean, Satan hates the family unit. He's been attacking the family unit ever since the beginning. It all goes back to Genesis. And so, um, and like JJ was saying, it's just the scary part about it is that kids can go around the consent of parents to go out and get these puberty blockers, these cross-sex hormones, these transgender surgeries, abortions, which are all physical mutilations, right? That is child abuse right there. It just reminds me of Isaiah 520. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who substitute light for darkness, darkness for light, bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. In other words, parents who protect their children from physical mutilation are somehow called child abuse, right? You see that inconsistency there. Now, to be clear, of course, no parent should ever abuse their children, right? We're not saying that. But children, um, of course, are precious. They're gifts from God. Uh, they're made in the image of God. So they're deserving our, of our protection. And because they're deserving of our protection, we should be protecting them from these things. As parents, it's the duty of every single parent, God-given duty, to protect them, especially as fathers as well. Um, as fathers, we have to be protecting our children from the lies of the culture, right? So unlike Disney, uh, don't, we don't tell our children to follow their heart right? The Bible says our, our hearts are deceitful and wicked above all things. Parents' job is to teach children by standing on God's word in every single area, not just some subjective feelings or whatever the culture says. Really, it's time for the church to wake up to this war around us, to the war on children, to the war on the family unit. Let's get into the, onto the front lines. Get off the sidelines, guys, and let's go out there. Let's protect children that's being, that's being abused, that's being physically mutilated. Let's really stand up for the next generation. If this bill passes, it could actually negate or distract from real child abuse that is occurring. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. And too, what's interesting is this particular law would also um, protect doctors from any liability uh, from doing these surgeries. So if these individuals, when they get older, decide, hey, what you did was awful to me and I want to sue you, they can't sue. Um, and so they're really protecting the medical industry, right, um, by doing this as well. So it's something to be concerned about and something um, people need to be aware of. And again, you know, you got to think about who, are, who am I voting into office, right? Who's going to represent my views best? Because, you know, um, there's a saying, so she's a, a well-known podcaster, Ali Bestucki, politics matter because policies matter because people matter. Absolutely. And so it really does matter what we, what, how we get out and, and who we're voting into office so that things like this, don't get passed and can get stopped. Yeah, politics, um, this is really legislative morality. And the question is, right. whose morality do you want to be legislated? And one yeah. of the only caveats that they actually put in here, in order to get around any kind of repercussions, they, they basically say any kind of reasonable effort to ensure that the minor in question has an understanding of the risks and benefits. You see that subjective nature. I mean, I just think about my little five-year-old. He runs around the house pretending like, you know, he's he's Batman, right? He'll come up to me. I'm Batman. I'm Spider-Man, right? And I, I can play that game all day. I'm like, I'm the Joker, you know? I, if you're Batman, I'm the Joker, right? But if he comes to me all of a sudden and says, I'm Susie, right? No, we're not going there. You can be Batman. You can't be Susie, right? And so again, as a God-given duty, as myself, as a father, that's what I need to be doing. I need to be protecting my child. Because, I mean, just, just think about it. How many young kids are actually making good decisions out there today, right? That's why we, they need the guidance of older generation of their parents to help them make wise decisions. Yeah. All right, proposed Canadian law could see Christians jailed for quoting the Bible. And so um, this is happening, obviously, uh, we always say Canada, some of these other European nations are just a little bit further ahead than America is on this stuff um, in the sense of what they're allowing. And so this bill, which is Bill C-367, basically, it, so they have a hate speech law already in Canada, okay? So that's already there, but there's a religious exemption within that hate speech law. And um, so they 
allow you to basically quote the Bible and they allow you, if you're doing it for religious reasons, to say that certain things are wrong or certain things are sin. But what this would do, and slippery slope, you know the minute that a hate speech law gets passed, that it's only a matter of time till all the exemptions are removed, right? And so, um, and then it's, and it's completely arbitrary too, because who decides what is hate? Um, and so it becomes a completely arbitrary law. But, um, you know, I, when I read this, I thought, what about the pastors who are quoting scripture every Sunday in church? If that offends someone, are they going to call that hate speech? And you could be jailed just for being a pastor and preaching in a church. Yeah, one of the justifications for um, passing this bill or, or introducing this bill is that there's a recent rise in anti-Semitic demonstrations in Canada. But I think the author of this article hits it on the head that says, but is the answer to anti-Semitic anti rhetoric in Canada the elimination of everyone's religious freedom? No, it's not. And that would take the re religious freedom away from people mm -hmm. if this bill was passed. And there's already stuff within the Canadian Criminal Code that prevents acts of genocide. So they already have those protections in place. So the answer is not removing religious freedom from everybody. Yeah, this whole thing of the hate crime charges, it really is a double standard. They're not neutral, right? So Because you think about the other way around, right? They're, they're okay with the hate crime against Christians, essentially what they're saying. Um, and, and really what they're trying to do is they're trying to implement the religion of sexual humanism, right? Anytime you elevate your own thoughts, your own opinions above God's word, that is humanism, and that is a religion. So they're trying to push these religious beliefs on everyone, regardless of their belief system. And so this is also just a reminder that persecution is guaranteed, right? It is guaranteed for followers of Christ. John 15 says it. Uh, um, J Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And so there's also a lot of other examples in God's word. It's just a reminder that we are living in a world, right? And because we're not of the world, it's going to hate us, right? Because we're following God. We're following his standards. And so it just reminds me also of Acts chapter 5. You remember back to the apostles of Peter and John. They were standing uh, before the high priest. They were arrested. And what did Peter say? Peter answered, we must obey God rather than man right? And that should be our MO. That should be our underlying principle for all of these type of situations, and not just in Canada, but it's coming to the United States as well, right? Um, usually we're always just a day behind in any of these other Western na nations. And so, of course, to be clear, right, we also want to make sure that we're not being offensive by our attitudes. We're not being jerks, of course. I mean, the gospel is offensive enough, right? We don't have, we don't have to add anything more to it. And so, um, and really this whole thing is the idea that you can practice your religion, you can keep it private, right? Just keep it between your ears, keep it in your homes, keep it in your churches, right? Uh, uh, just don't bring it out into the public where others can disagree. But that's exactly what they need. We need to be speaking truth in the public because these people need to be transformed into a new creation in Christ. Um, it actually hit it right on the head when the, when the article says, uh, that the Bible's message is an affront to their lifestyle and their pride. They don't want to hear it. Their consciences can't tolerate it. And that's why they need to be transformed. They need to have a new heart with new desires that desires God. And so finally as well, Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Regardless, right, no matter what situation, we must always fear God rather than fearing man. So we cannot let the state, we can't let Caesar really intimidate us into compromising God's word. We got to stand on it boldly and uncompromisingly with zero compromise. Yeah, and we all also have a book that's a good resource, Will They Stand by Ken Ham too, mm -hmm. that will equip you to stand on the authority of God's word with issues like this. Yep. Yeah, and you know, I was thinking of the passage of Matthew and the Beatitudes where Jesus has said, you know, you're going to be persecuted. And so it says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And that's kind of hard to think about when we're being persecuted. But again, our reward isn't here on earth, right? We got to mm -hmm. think about that our reward is in heaven. And um, the most loving thing that we can do is to speak the truth in love. And we have to be willing to do that. And we have to train ourselves and prepare ourselves and get ready for those times, right? Um, when that persecution is happening. And there are, there are people all over the world I mean, we've got it easy here in the yep. U.S. We yep. really do, um, that are being persecuted for their faith. And so we need to remember to pray for them um, and, and not be surprised when these kinds of things happen. Mm -hmm. All right, lastly, Earth's coral reefs are far bigger than we thought, satellite imagery reveals. Now, what did you think when you read this article? <laughs> well, I was, I was grateful for the research that they were doing. I thought it's really cool that they're able to see moral cor coral reefs. And we almost... <laughs> Almost got to the end of this without talking about climate change, like but not quite. Time. But not quite. They <laughs> yeah. had to rope it in, and so I was like, ah, when I saw that. But it, 
I mean, it's it's just another fear mongering thing. They're talking about how um, as we make new discoveries with coral reefs, they're reeling climate change is steadily heating up the the sea and making it more acidic. Um, but there's things that show that that is not true. Um, the Coral thrive in warm temperatures, not cold temperatures. So warm water is actually very good for corals. And an increase in CO2 is also really great for corals to be able to thrive. And ocean pH levels uh, vary depending upon where you are or sea or where you are in the sea. And so there is an um, acidic and uh, basic uh, pH scale. And the ocean is actually alkaline. It's more basic. It is above seven, which is neutral on the pH scale. So it's not even acidic, but they use things like acidification to scare you and make you think that the ocean is heating up to levels that it shouldn't be heating up to, but that's just not the case. So you need to be careful and uh, pick through some of the language they use and the terminology here. I actually have an article that I just wrote um, that is released on our website um, that you can go look. It's on climate science and some of the cherry-picked data that some agencies are promoting um, in regards to climate science, and we'll equip you to stand on the authority of God's word when looking at those things. Yeah, I, just like JJ was saying, I was really enjoying the article until the very end, right? It was actually really cool technology. They're talking about using high-resolution satellite data covering the entire world. Uh, they're taking 100 trillion pixels from uh, a couple different CubeSat satellites, and uh, they're working with a team of over 500 researchers, collaborators to try to make these maps. It's the world's first comprehensive map of coral reefs. Great observational science, of course. And then at the very end, they're like, oh, and climate change is steadily making so, uh, <laughs> and there it is. So, and also to be clear, right? We, we should be leading the charge on conservation efforts, right? We should be leading the charge on trying to conserve the coral reefs. As Christians, we actually have the biblical worldview to do that. In the evolutionary worldview, think about it. Why bother taking care of coral reefs, right? Why bother even taking care of this earth, this spinning rock, spinning around other uh, big balls of rocks? And so really, who says, right? Who says that we should take care of the planet? Well, it's because God's word says we're given dominion. We're to subdue the earth and to fulfill it and to really fulfill that dominion mandate. And God is in complete control of his creation. And we see see that in his word too. He tells us that he's upholding the seasons and the cycles that he has put in place. Yep. And we found too, like we've done a number of articles on this, that animals, when they evaluate them and even corals and things like that, discovering that they actually are able to adapt and deal with warmer temperatures or if things get more acidic or whatever it might be, because God has designed these organisms, right, to be able to adapt and deal with this in a fallen world. And so um, instead of the fear mongering, right, we should believe the, the verse in Genesis 8 that talks about, you know, all these things are going to continue, the seasons, all of that. God is the one that decides when that ends, right? Mm -hmm. not, not, it's not going to be due to climate change. We yeah. need to take care. We need to steward the earth that we have, but not be afraid. Yeah, we're not the creators. God is the creator. He's yeah. in control. Um, so one other resource we just wanted to mention, and this is like a little bit of self-promotion here. So, <laughs> uh, so I co-wrote this book with Stacia McKeever, and it's called Crafted by God. And it's a really great um, book for children, parents to read to their children about the development of the baby in the womb. So we use some of our imagery from our Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit. It has lots of engaging, interactive things for kids to really teach them um, to be pro-life, regardless of, you know, we talk about level of development, regardless of disability or ability, regardless of any of those things that we are all human beings made in the image of God. And then coming up, um, we have a uh, couple of, and this also is related to children because we have our Answers for Educators conference. This is for Christian school teachers to be able to come and learn more about how to build that biblical worldview and be able to teach it in their classroom. So that's July 21st and 22nd. That will be here at the Creation Museum as well as at um, Answers Academy, which is our K through 12 uh, school that we have just a couple of miles from here. And we're also in the process of developing a Christian school Bible curriculum. Um, so grades K through second are complete, and you can order them from our website. This is called our 12 Stones curriculum. And so it's really more than just a Bible curriculum. It's a biblical worldview curriculum. And so um, I'm really excited about that. That Again, we want to educate that next generation. That mm -hmm. is the key. That's what we're talking about, Well, they stand. That's the key to be able to really, again, raise up a generation that loves God and serves him and lives for him. So we are out of time for today. So we'll see you back here next Wednesday at two o'clock. See you then. God bless.